On today's episode of The Nick Stanley Show, I sit down with my friend Colin Hanks, actor and storyteller. We discuss the challenges of creative work, his new upcoming projects, and we have quite a good time along the way. That's why I love my job. I'll be able to do it until literally I die. Intent is like someone says like, okay, ready, rolling and action. And then I just fuck, you know, <laughs> die. Like that's how I'm, that's how I'm going out. So he's like, did we get that? Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> Colin dives into his process in making documentary films. Ask a million dumb questions and maybe one right one. As you hear people's answers, the film starts to reveal itself. And when it comes to advice and creative work, Colin doesn't hold back. The thing that I really did just learned in the last, I would say, 10 years, huge chunk of that is leaning into being incredibly uncomfortable and having self-doubt, not being sure if it's going to work. You got to lean into that. If we're going to boil down your wisdom there, focus on the things you can control, not the yeah. things that you can't. can't. Whether that's acting, making movies, or any other line of work and you're not getting the opportunities you want you are building skills towards something and you never know what those opportunities might be and when it comes you'll be ready to seize that opportunity yeah I, yeah that that's <laughs> wow you actually you made me sound really really smart colin hanks what is up my man how's you know this, that, the other thing, just trying to, trying to stay, uh, you know, stay busy and stay sane. Those are, uh, those are the things. I'm sorry that I can't be there in person. I really wish I could be, uh, cause I'd love to see you. Uh, I mean, we've known each other for uh, decades now, I'm afraid to say. Yeah. So yeah. it would have been good to see you in person, but I'm glad we have this. Well, it's funny. I've been thinking that what the show really is now is a chance to hang out with people like you that it's, it's so hard, right. With kids and careers. And I mean, both of our wives work and the kids are older, so they're all doing stuff. I mean, when, yeah. when we were, when we were a little younger, it was easy to just get together and hang. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and nurse the hangover, uh, the next day, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Things yes. have changed, but uh, it's all 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 in a good direction. That's right. That's right. It is all for the better. Um, so what what have you been doing lately? I know you've been all over the globe and running around. Yeah, yeah. I've been I, I've been uh, fortunate. I've been really uh, busy. You know, we had a writer strike and an actor strike not too long ago, and as a result of that, there's been a lot of. Um, change in the entertainment industry and so there's a lot less stuff getting made and so aside from just the general hustling that you have to do to try and get projects going and all that sort of stuff i've been fortunate and been able to land a couple of uh a couple of acting gigs um and uh, as well as uh, uh you know I, I direct documentaries so um i've been directing a documentary as well so i've just kind of been juggling i i guess is the best way to describe it i, I kind of feel like i'm trying to juggle on a unicycle except i don't know how to do either of those things <laughs> um that i guess is an apt dis description although i know how to do these things i <laughs> i know how to act i know how to direct documentaries but i don't know, just uh yeah, just juggling a whole bunch. Oh, see, I already, you want to know what I don't know how to do? Just silence my phone. It's funny as I was on a Zoom earlier and I did that and <laughs> I only said it for an hour and then it literally just lapsed. So there you go. Hey. See, I'm human. human. Yeah, that's right. So not everybody knows that you make documentary films and I do. Mm -hmm love your documentary work um and i want to talk about the the upcoming movies as well but let's touch on the on the documentary because i think that's super interesting okay. um it's about john candy right and mm -hmm. i i'm a i'm a huge fan myself i think this is a really cool project and we haven't had a chance to like chat about it so i'm i'm real curious about how it's how it's developing um how it got started all that good stuff 
Uh, yeah, well, it's, you know, it's been a, a long process. Each one of these endeavors is, is a little bit different. And this one, uh, is definitely been, uh, been different. Um, you know, I, I'll be honest, I, I'm sort of wary to sort of get too much into the actual movie itself, just because we're, we're still making it. Uh, and you know, the movie, uh, doesn't really reveal itself until the end. And then you abandon it because, uh, uh you know, the clock has run out and the bell has rung. But the way it sort of came about was really uh, unique. Um, I uh, got an email one day saying that uh, Ryan Reynolds uh, and his production company uh, were involved in doing a John Candy documentary and they wanted to talk to me about directing it. Um, and the prospect of doing a, a doc on John had, had come up in the past. Uh, and I had sort of politely sort of said no. Um, but you know, Ryan being the uh, excellent salesman that he is, uh, didn't really, uh, push me too hard. And, and we just had, you know, just long conversations, uh, about, you know, uh, the process of, of making a doc. And, you know, there, there's so many, um, there's so many ideas that you have, for documentaries, right? Everyone just, it's kind of like a, a catch all phrase now, like someone should make a documentary about that. Yeah. And I think that's a very simple statement to make, but what that actually, what that story actually is, a lot of times does not pass the test of, okay, let's actually make a documentary about that. Um, the actual, like process of it of like, okay, what is the actual story? What is the theme? What is it that you're trying to explore? What is it that we don't know? Um, what is it that we think we know, but we actually don't? I mean, there's any number of sort of questions that you need to ask yourself uh, about making, you know, documentary films. And to Ryan's credit, he really gave me the time to really genuinely think about it and and really just try and hammer home, okay, what exactly could this be? And uh, you know, he has a relationship with uh, John's uh, uh, children, uh, Chris and, and Jennifer. I have a relationship with them as well. So I called them and just sort of said, hey, you know, is this a real thing? Are you guys really behind this? And they said, yes, we are. And we want you to do it too. So after a lot of internal discussions with them, we sort of landed on a general sort of theme and idea. And that tends to be sort of the launching point. And then as you shoot interviews and you start editing things together and you hear people's answers, the film starts to reveal itself as to what it actually really is and what you actually have. And so you kind of scorch earth uh, in these yeah. interviews and ask a million dumb questions and maybe one right one. Um, and you search and you look like an idiot, you know, trying to <laughs> say, you know, ask these questions and people just say, you could not be more wrong. <laughs> um, but you just collect and collect and collect. And that's pretty much been the, the story with, with, with candy. I think, What's been unique about it is I've been able to make all my previous docs, both the ones that I've directed and the ones that I've produced, in a certain layer of not necessarily secrecy, but no one really knew that I was making them. Um, this one, because Ryan is so famous and so many people pay attention to him, uh, word got out that we were doing it he confirmed it and like we hadn't even found a home for it yet we hadn't even made it so i've probably talked more about the john candy doc not only <laughs> in these what last 10 minutes i've been monologuing but for the last two years um because there's this incredible interest in john um simple as that and so we're getting closer still probably going to be another year or so um Okay. In reality, but uh, we're getting close. Yeah, I promise all of my answers will be much more succinct from now on. <laughs> it's it's all good. Is uh, is Ryan as as fun and cool to work with as as it would seem? Yeah, I mean, he, our conversations have been nothing but 
but delightful. And you know, he is an incredibly busy guy. So I really am working uh, uh, very closely with his partner George Dewey and the team over at Maximum Effort, and they've been incredibly um, involved. And I think you know, without knowing too much about how their organization runs, I have a feeling once we start getting assemblies and cuts together, then you know, then Ryan will be able to to give his his expertise, and, and that's kind of what I wanted. That that was kind of what we discussed. Is like, look, let let me go off and do this, um, and I'll work with everybody. Um, so you'll you, you know you'll be informed, and but wait until we actually have something, because yeah. that's really you only get one chance at making a first impression. Wasn't that like some horrible shampoo commercial tagline? Um, yeah. But uh, it's true, and so uh, probably going to be leaning on him a whole lot more. Um, as we get closer to the finish line, but yeah, dudes, he said, dude's cool, man. He's great. He really is. He's, he's a genuine article. There's no doubt about him. Are you going to get out to a Wrexham game at some point? I'm thinking about it actually. Yeah. It's funny. I actually helped arrange tickets for my brother-in-law and his wife and a couple of friends. I haven't even gone yet, but I'm going to be over in the UK quite a bit over the course of the next year or so. I'm probably going to be making my way to uh, to Wales. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah we're hoping, hoping, hoping to check out a, a bunch of, uh, of football when I'm over there because I'm a huge Liverpool supporter. I've never been to Anfield. I've never never seen a game there, and and yeah, I, I I love soccer. I love proper yeah. football. So I mean, we, the last time I saw you was at a, a proper football match. So yes, at the uh, LAFC game. Yeah, that's um, right. Yes, and all the uh, parents from my son's soccer team were very excited. Colin Hanks was uh, hanging <laughs> hanging in the crowd with us. That was fun. Well, this spring uh, we're we're talking about taking the the family over there. Anfield is on the is on the, the list. list for sure, um, and yeah. and possibly Wrexham if it like worked into the travel plans. Just because I think that's like a it's a whole different. Uh, feeling that stadium being small and it, the, it's that small town. And it's a, uh, I attended a few games like that 20 years ago in Italy, in these small towns. And it's, I mean, man, it's really cool. Uh, and those people love their teams, like in a way that is, is just different than with the, yeah. with the huge clubs. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I'm not talk too much about it, but you know, I'm sorry. Talking about documentaries, I had been wanting to do a documentary about like a minor league baseball team and how important teams are to communities. And, you know, obviously America being America, baseball being the, the national pastime, that sort of seemed like such a great idea. And we pitched it a whole bunch and everyone just said, no, no, it's not that interesting. <laughs> and then when I started with Ryan, I said, you know, you actually cracked the code. What I didn't have were two incredibly famous guys becoming owners and buying a sports club of a sport they didn't really even know in a foreign country. I didn't know that was the missing piece. So, <laughs> right. uh, yeah, but, um, no, I'm, it's, uh, I'm, I would be really excited to go over there. Cause again, it's, it's just a, a completely different experience. And, not and Liverpool look good under slot. Um, I thought they were yeah. going to take a, yeah, I, a real dip, you. like for a few years. Thank you for inviting me to your sports podcast. This is great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, how, did you uh, take some perverse joy in the Dodgers' pain last night? Uh, as I told somebody uh, last night, uh, although I do not care for either the Dodgers or the Padres. Um, I've definitely been enjoying the series. It's a great series. Um, and if the Padres beat the Dodgers, totally cool with that. Totally cool with that. Um, (laughs) but I also just want a great series. Um, and that one's definitely it. Uh, so, you know, I'm a big believer in sort of highlighting the fact that, uh, you know, West coast baseball, although majority of the country doesn't see it is just as good and just as tense. Um, as you know, your Red Sox Yankees. So the fact that, you know, the Padres are able to, to, you know, 
have that kind of rivalry with the Dodgers the same way that the well, not the same way that the Giants do, but you know, close enough right. uh, is uh, pretty great. You just got back from Germany, is that right? What were you doing over there? So I would know. I was so I started out the year in Budapest, uh, working on an independent movie called Nuremberg which takes place, which is a city located in Germany. Okay. Uh, And then um, I just recently got back from Winnipeg, Mm -hmm. uh, Manitoba, as I like to call it. I like to call it Winnipeg, Manitoba, Um, (laughs) because I think the province names uh, are uh, essential. Um, And uh, I was doing uh, the sequel to Nobody uh, when I was there. So... um, yeah, I, I was in fake, faked, uh, faked Germany for for Budapest, but most recently, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a headache already, right? It's, it's yeah, I, it's just like <laughs> it's it's hard to keep up with your schedule. I know, the, I know, I know. It's Nuremberg all about. Let's start with that one. Uh, Nuremberg is a movie that is, uh, based on a, a, a book called, uh, the Nazi and the psychiatrist or the psychiatrist and the Nazi. I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it is about, uh, the Nuremberg, uh, war trials, uh, after world war two and sort of the intricacies and the delicacies of actually, putting people on trial for the first time for crimes against humanity. And um, at the core, there's a relationship between uh, Herman uh, uh, Goering and uh, a psychiatrist. And uh, they form a a relationship, but it obviously has uh, tremendous um, uh, relevancy in terms of, you know, modern day uh politics and the current rise of you know dictatorships and fascism and and things of that nature um so the film really sort of explores you know uh the fact that uh the world uh you know uh, growing up when we when we were kids you know we were just sort of taught yeah the nazis are the bad guys that's why yeah in that's who indiana jones fights um right but uh the truth is, is yes, they were bad guys, but it's a lot grayer than I think uh, anyone cares to admit. It's not so black and white, you know. Um, the truth is, is that really bad people have wives and mothers and kids and neighbor come from neighborhoods, and they make everything seem to make sense and seem kind of rational. And there's always a kernel of truth in what it is that they're saying, right? Like it's this really delicate thing where you can't just say that they are an abomination, they're monsters because they were human beings, you know? Uh, and so it, it's a delicate thing. And, you know, I, I, I don't mean to, to, to speak for, for the movie at all, really. Um, you know, the movie will come out and people will, or will make their own decisions, but there just seemed to be a lot uh, in that subject matter that I thought was really, uh, really interesting. Yeah, it sounds interesting. And it's also, I think there's a lot of value in exploring the gray area there, because if they are just monstrous bad guys, then you can kind of put that to the side wherever you live and say it could, it could never happen here. It could never yeah. happen to us. Yeah. And if, and if you understand the nuances just a little bit through a story, you can kind of understand how it can happen even in a, I mean, it's not like all German people were bad people. They just yeah. got sucked into a movement that was bad. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I mean, they were lied to and manipulated and forced into a thought process that was perverted and uh, wrong. And that's unfortunately very common throughout history. Um, yeah. And if you don't actually take a look, uh, a real look at what history is like, you're doomed to repeat it. Um, and I think that's really what the film uh, kind of explores. Um, 
And, you know, I think ultimately, you know, in this, in the context of the last couple of years, I, I, I think there's a lot of that going around. I mean, that, I think that's kind of one of the reasons why we're, um, sort of in the position that we're in now um, as a country. We've been taking a much harsher look at what our American history is. And it's pretty brutal at times. And it's pretty dark at times um, for a lot of people. Um, And, you know, just taking the time and having the awareness of really trying to understand just what was at stake in those moments and what happened, what transpired and the thought process that got everyone there. Like you have to look at that and it's not just they're bad guys and they're good guys. It's just not, that's just not how life operates. Uh, That's how movies operate. Um, (laughs) You know, uh, a lot of them. Um, But you know, we've seen this a lot with, you know, American history, you know, Civil War history. But we've also seen it, you know, in, in regards to uh, World War II. You know, I, in fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I saw um, Moises Kaufman, who I, I uh, did a, a play with many, many moons ago in New York. He's got a, a, a new play that's all about, you know, these collections of photos of the families that worked at uh, uh, a concentration camp, uh, who's, you know, the, the heads of the family that were Nazis. And, you know, it's these idyllic pho- photos. And the whole play is like, how can these photos that look so joyful and so happy be Nazis <laughs> and, right. you know, in charge of these horrible 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 atrocities um so i think there's sort of a cultural shift um and there's some pushback and fight about it but um it's amazing to me that you know and i think this is one of the trips about getting older it's amazing to me remembering how i was taught history and the difference between how the history is now being taught. And and I think it's a fabulous thing. I am much more interested in truth than I am uh, in, in falsehoods. So the idea of being able to sort of explore that uh, is pretty exciting. But also at the end of the day, hey man, I'm, I, I'm just an actor. So I go <laughs> and I, I've got, a, you know, re- I, I got a few scenes in this great movie I'm super excited about. You know, people are going to see the movie and be like, he was barely in the thing. He got me so excited. (laughs) Well, to your point there, I think on on like the stories that we tell ourselves or the stories that we're told, I think it was Kurt Vonnegut who said, as kids, we grow up learning that 1492 is this moment and this year to be celebrated because that's when people first came to North America and started living vibrant, exciting lives. And he said, and the truth is that there were people living vibrant, exciting lives for hundreds of years there. 1492 was just when sea pirates showed up and killed most of them. And yeah. Yeah. And brought horrible diseases that <laughs> wiped out. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. Yeah. Vonnegut was interesting. Yeah. You know. He, he, he definitely believed in, you know, give me some truth, as the wise, uh, the wise man once said. I am reading a, a book by Naval Harari. He's the guy that wrote Sapiens, and he has a new yeah. book out called Nexus, and it's about information systems. And he goes from like the most basic information systems all the way up to AI. Yeah. And the first chapter is on how humans naturally exist in tribes of one to 200 people and function a lot like chimpanzees do or the Neanderthals did. And he says it was an information system known as the story. He's like, that's what allowed humans to exist in groups that suddenly were thousands large or tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands and thrive versus these other groups the chimpanzees, the Neanderthals couldn't tell each other stories. They couldn't all believe in the same story. And when we share a story, 
suddenly we don't need to know each other personally to work together or trust each other. And I thought it was a, a, this, this penetrating insight into the importance of story. Cause he says, you know, over thousands of years, we actually evolved to internalize stories, take them very seriously and then live our lives according to these stories. And so, and I, I just thought, man, that, really puts a nice context around the work that that you do as a storyteller, whether you're making a documentary or mm -hmm. working as an actor or all the people that you work with. Mm -hmm. It still is fundamental to what we are and who we are. Like people always say things like, oh, it's playing pretend. It's um, uh, running off to join the circus. And, uh, and sure, there's yeah. a, there's an element of that because I think I'm sure it's a it's a very it's a very fun, exciting lifestyle when it's when it's all going well but it really is this important critical work at the same time yeah i'm a big believer in both things can exist both things can be true and i think that applies to everything it applies to every interaction it applies to every relationship um you know, there's your truth, my truth, and the truth, you know, um, yeah. and both can be true. And, you know, while I always like to say I, you know, ran off and joined the circus, or, you know, my job is to wear makeup and pretend to be other people for a living, that's true. And sometimes I make big, silly movies that could never actually happen, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, just did nobody, uh, two with Bob Odenkirk. And that's like, an that's an action movie, man. And that's yeah. like, I'm, I'm a bad guy and I'm menacing and I'm, you know, and it starts in reality and then it just goes completely action movie, crazy nuts. And, and that's what that is. That's a story and it's, you know, fun. Um, that can exist. So can, you know, telling stories uh, a little bit more seriously, like Nuremberg. Um, and so does, you know, documentaries and, you know, having the people that actually lived it help tell that story. I remember someone once sort of said to me, and, and they were being very gracious and, and very poetic, but I, I really did take them at their word where they said, and it's like my therapy watching movies. It's my escape. It's where I learn about myself. You know, I learn about, um, you know, I learn about culture. I learn about society. I, I you know, I can see things that, that maybe I, I haven't seen before. And I think there's power to that. Um, I think it's also good to know that at the end of the day, I am still wearing makeup and pretending to be other people <laughs> for a living. You know, I don't want to take yeah. myself that seriously. Right. Um, so, you know, you try and take everything with a grain of salt. But yeah, I mean, both things are true. Story is incredibly important, you know, and it can also be very dangerous uh, if told the wrong way um, right. or manipulated. And so... Uh, at the end of the day, I, it's pretty fascinating that idea of, you know, story being the thing that helped make it expand, you know, uh, bigger than just those 200, you know, one to 200. Uh, that's pretty fascinating. Have you watched, uh, Peaky Blinders? Yeah, that show. I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've watched Peaky Blinders. Of course. I, I just discovered it recently. Um, I love the show. Like, um, yeah, it's a great show nuts for it i mean that dude that uh every time arthur screams like by order the peaky blind us like yeah. i just oh it it uh taps into the the irish in me yeah. um uh, but i man i was watching it the other night and i just oh, i was moved by how i thought man th like this group of people came together they're all these grown adults and they're playing pretend so hard and so well that I am just lost in this show. Every, <laughs> every episode that it comes on, I am transported back to the early 1900s about uh -huh. a bunch of Irishmen in England. I mean, it doesn't even, and, and they're all, and they're all gangsters. Like I have no relation to that um, subject matter on the, yeah. on the surface, but it, yeah. It, yeah, it just, it just touched me on, on how well 
executed it is and how it transports me to this other place. Well, I mean, that, that, that's the magic of, you know, the, the, the industry, um, you know, based on the storyteller and who is telling the story and how they do it, quality of it, it can, you know, help you escape. You know, I mean, they so you know, always said, you know, the, the escape of the movies. And then, yeah, it's true. You know, you escape to a darkened theater and you watch something communally with other people. Um, or now you just watch it, you know, on your phone when you're, uh, you know, <laughs> stuck at a red light. But um, <laughs> the quality of the storytelling, it's important. And when it works, man, it's it, it really is magical. I mean, it's it is magic. It, part of it is luck. It, part of it is literally just all these things line up and it just it 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 presents itself. Um, and a lot can go wrong. And when it goes wrong, it's pretty evident. I mean, you you you, you kind of know. Um, and yeah, costumes help. Yeah, you know, stories set in another time that helps. You know, there are crutches the same way. You know, telling uh, uh, in a documentary. You know, if you hear a narrator, well, okay, well, that's <laughs> them using that crutch of being able to say, "We really want you to know these specific facts." Um, but. If anything is done well, particularly storytelling, that can have a tremendous effect. I mean, that, that to me, I, I remember in high school having a history teacher who, for the first time, was honestly, I just went like, he's just telling stories. Like he's presenting concepts about ancient civilizations and cultures and he's presenting it in a way that i can understand because he's taking the time to paint the picture that changed my view of history you know and yeah. and what i what i what i draw from it uh, uh the same way you know uh, a movie about complex uh, personal relationships can change the way I feel about my own personal complex relationships. Um, so there's great power, um, you know, uh, as well as, you know, as the meme says, the, with great power comes responsibility. That is, that, that, you know, that is true. Yeah. Spider-Man's uncle was right. Um, but he knew something. Uh, yeah, he knew something. He, you know, and he got it out like right at the last second too, which is, I mean, good for him. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, when, when it's done well, it, it, it can be really great. And the, the, the truth is, is when, when you're working on one, that's not, that's when you go, oh, fuck, this is hard. I, this is challenging. This is, and that's when you got to be like, Hey man, we're just wearing makeup and pretending to be other people. No one wants to right. hear you complain about this yet. So just <laughs> right. Right. take the lumps. <laughs> you know, take the L. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, watch the game tape, and then okay, what can we do better next time? Right. So, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Am I saying that right? Yeah, you are. Winnipeg, well Manitoba. Uh, Mani nobody's Manitoba. Manitoba. Oh, Manitoba. 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 Okay. I, uh, maybe, I, maybe it's an accent you're doing though. I. I, I, I mean, it <laughs> yes. could be it. Could I've be been it. working on that Canadian one. Yeah. yeah. The. Uh, so nobody's two. Uh, I I just recently saw the first one, and mm -hmm. it's crazy to me that you are going to be in the sequel because I swear, <laughs> before knowing that, I had this thought watching this movie. And I thought, man, I gotta get Colin on the show soon because <laughs> in the next two or three years, like obviously you have done all kinds of stuff from Orange County to Fargo to uh, I, we'll put all we'll I'll list all of them in the show notes uh, for people that, that want to go find all of all of your work like it's been a super successful career already but I have this uh, theory if you want to hear it because it's completely basis and let's I go. have uh, no authority on this topic uh, I, I think in the next two I, so let's just uh, <laughs> right. let's just bullshit into these microphones and into people's ears there we go. Uh, I think the next two, three years, your career is going to explode. And I had the thought watching nobodies and thinking about Bob Odenkirk, mm -hmm. where this guy, 
he was always a super creative, interesting person. I saw him do yeah. stand up. I mean, I think I was 20 years old and he was doing yeah. stand up at some 200 person theater out on uh, Melrose. And then he suddenly hits a, a certain age, has certain qualities and talents. And it kind of all came together for him with first breaking bad and then call Saul. And now yeah. I mean, talk about something that's completely out of his wheelhouse going and doing action star stuff, yeah. but it yeah. works. He's fantastic in it. And, and it was like this, this snap insight where I, I thought of your first big break was orange County and you mm -hmm. have this face where I think, you know, you're blessed with a face where you look 10 years younger than, than you are, which is a good thing. It's finally paying off. <laughs> <laughs> It sucks for a good long while, let me tell you. But it's, yeah, it's definitely paying off now, yeah. And I just thought, man, as Colin suddenly hits a certain age and look, like all of these uh, layered bad person, or people, not, not bad, but like people that are very complex, complex. with good qualities yeah. and bad qualities, yeah. I think is just going to come flooding your way kind of like Bob Odenkirk and the fact that you ended up in the sequel uh, <laughs> just seems very serendipitous to me. And I, I mean, yeah, I would, yeah, yeah, I still pinch myself that, that Bob even thought of me to be quite honest. Um, I would like to think that it's because of all that you just said in terms of what his journey is, you know, um, all of us as performers, as creative people, trying to make, you know, some, some semblance of art, you're constantly wanting to do more. Um, but you're, you have these obstacles and limitations in front of you. And so there are some people that self generate and do it and they have the hustle and they have the skills and they're able to go out and make it. I really wasn't able to do that. You know, I don't have the skill set to sit down and actually write something um i mean i literally don't have the academic <laughs> skill set to do it um but uh that's a joke um but i could only really work when given the opportunity and a lot of times the opportunity is not quite what you know you the performer wants it to be you know they want to be better they want to be in something of quality they want to say something important they don't want to be in a slapstick comedy where it's the people fall down show um <laughs> and i think it's taking me it's taken me a very long time to really understand a very basic premise which is you know each experience is going to be its own it's going to be different the same way each project is going to be its own. It's going to be different. And if you're fortunate enough and given enough opportunities, you can have a wide variety of different, you know, roles in different kinds of movies. And it's not, you know, it's not the easier path. Um, you know, at times it's been really difficult and, you know, challenging just for me, you know, and not physically or, you know, anything like that, but, you know, from an emotional standpoint, from a psychological standpoint, you know, every actor, every writer within us, there is this fear of like, has my window closed? You know, is that all I get? Is that my shot? Um, that's just in, that's just baked into the, our DNA. Um, and, you know, it took me a long while and a lot of therapy to be able to learn how to, to navigate that and have it not be the end of the world when it's not, you know, exactly, you know, what you, 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 you hoped your opportunity would be. But I have been incredibly fortunate to have been able to play in a lot of different genres and do a lot of really different stuff. Bob is a shining example of that. You know, I mean, this is the guy he wrote, you know, the super fan sketch, you know, the bears, the bears, yeah. the bulls. He wrote that sketch. Yeah. Like he yeah. wrote on SNL. He created, co-created Mr. Show, which for my money is the funniest, you know, sketch comedy program of, you know, of all time. 
but you know, unbelievable. It's also also it was, my generation's, you know, Monty <laughs> Python, if you will. Um, yes. Uh, he directed movies for years, you know, um, trying to get something going and then happened to be given the opportunity to play what was supposed to be a small part on Breaking Bad. And all of this lessons that he had learned up to that point, you know, they stacked up and he was able to deliver in a way that no one else was prepared for. And then all of a sudden they went, oh, shit, this is so good. We should make him a bigger part of this series. Same thing happened with Aaron Paul, by the way, too. Um, oh. And, you know, and then it's, well, then let's do our show about that. So he took all of that and then he took the skills he learned from being a creative and doing the writing and coming up with a story and, and working with other creative people. And he helped come up with the ideas for, you know, for nobody. And he surrounded himself with people that know how to make those kinds of movies. And so I was incredibly inspired to be able to get that, you know, that email from Bob saying like, will you please do this? Um, I was shocked because it doesn't happen to me very often. You know, it hasn't in the past, um, where people just say like, they give you the role. I, I, I still audition, you know, 99% of the time, you know, it's taken me a good long while to learn that, you know, it's not actually like a line, you know, your career, your life is not actually a line. It actually stacks on top of each other. and. Um, you know, it's taken me a long time to, to understand that. And I kind of feel like I have a little bit more of an understanding now. And, you know, look, my life's purpose is to try and learn as much as I can. So, uh, yeah, I look, I hope you're right. I'm touching all sorts of what appears to be wood, but it could just be plastic formica that looks like wood. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping the next two years are, uh, are, are, are good. And I keep being able to get the, the, you know, those opportunities. Yeah. Okay. Question for you. So my son who's in middle school loves okay. storytelling, acting. It's his favorite thing to do has been for several years. And yeah. I have a, a buddy who's a, a talent agent for kids and he's his advice. He just said, Hey, don't put him in the, an adult's world. Uh, stay, stay away from that. He's like, if he's telling his own stories right now where he's, you know, writing something out and shooting it and then cutting it together, like just let him keep having fun and learn to do that. But I wanted to know, and Good. I agree with that. Um, and uh, we've taken that advice to I, heart, but I wanted to get your advice on. I agree one thousand percent, one thousand percent. I've had a lot of parents come up to me. Um, you know, I'm doing something where I'm, you know, working with this young kid actor, and you know, it used to not happen so much. It happens more now because I'm playing like the dad. But uh, it would always sort of come up like, hey, what should my kid do? Like, what kind of acting class should we do? Do you have any suggestions? And I would just say, like, you should do the school play. Uh huh. You know, or if you just graduated college, you should go do an improv class. Like, just, you know, I, I, there's no specific thing. But give yourself an opportunity to do it at any level that is presented to you that is available and focus on that. And if you love it enough and the world is kind and presents enough of those opportunities to you based on luck, magic, someone else's talent, your talent, any number of things, then maybe those opportunities will still present themselves. And yes, some of it involves hustle and all of those kinds of things. They're not denying that at all. But if, you know, we're talking about a kid, I mean, it's amazing that a kid talent agent said that because it's a hundred percent true. Just do that. 
you know, and specifically as, you know, talking as a, about an actor, you know, in regards to a child actor, be a kid. The acting will always be there. You'll be, a, I, that's why I love my job. I'll be able to do it until literally I die. I mean, literally, someone's going to say, like, my intent is like, someone says, like, okay, ready, rolling, and action, and then I just, fuck, you know, <laughs> die. Like, that's how I'm, <laughs> that's how I'm going out. Um, so, we, like, do we get that? Yeah, yeah yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, um, but, you know, like, that's how much I, 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 I actually genuinely love the doing of the thing. And that was, like, one of the big lessons for me was, like, don't worry about the, you know, yes, you want to worry about the quality of it. Yes, you want to do good work. You want to do all those things, but don't obsess over that stuff. The art is in the doing. And so do it at any opportunity you can, at any opportunity that is presented. And, you know, for kids, that's school. So go to school. Yeah. Not an acting school, just a school. Yeah. Um, you know, do it in, co- you know, people in college, you know, should I go to college? Yeah, go. If you have the opportunity, go take a theater class, take an improv class because, hell, they do improv classes for kids now. I mean, you know, this is very different from when 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 we were growing up. So there are tons of opportunities. Um, and, you know, look, I also say this to writers and filmmakers where they just go like, I'm just not given the opportunity to do that. I said, that is nonsense. You have a phone. Mm-hmm. If you have a phone, you can make short films. You right. have the ability. Um, you're focusing on someone, you know, it needs to be of a certain caliber and a certain thing. That's not, that's not true. And I've been guilty of it too, by the way. I, you know, I'm not, uh, uh, you know, certainly no, uh, no, uh, uh, authority on, on, on any of this. Um, but yeah, just, uh, and this is going to be easy for you. Just tell your kid to go to school. Yeah. Yeah. Just shut up. Sure. And go to school kid. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it <laughs> sounds like leaning into the the love of it, especially when you're young is key. Cause what I'm hearing from you is that the love as an adult, it's the love of the craft that's going to sustain you through these insane ups and downs which Comple- are just part of the process completely Com- one thousand again one thousand percent and the trap is just complaining about all the stuff that is not going your way you know well oh if i had only been get, you know if they didn't do this or if the business worked differently or you know if i they had this headshot instead of that you know just yeah. complaining and being bitter about the state of things like i understand that and look i've bent about it too you know i'm not always you know this uh uh, uh, i'm not always this great um (laughs) but you know it's all about really just sort of having to be honest and truthful about your situation and finding out if you have that passion and the truth is is I, I really do not have the desire to to really be anything else, nor nor do I have the skill set in order to do so. <laughs> um, but you know, there's room. You know, there's leeway for that. I mean, that's how Doc started for me. You know, I didn't have the skill set of being able to sit down and write something for myself to to star in. Um, but I wasn't working as much as I wanted, and I was sort of angry and bitter about that. And and so I said, uh, I, I want to do something. And I said, well, I'm a storyteller. I mean, literally, I said, I'm a storyteller. Um, I've done interviews where I've been interviewed. I like photography. I like composition. I know about how movies are actually made, physically made, what it takes to make a movie. What if I try doing a documentary? And it just so happened that the idea had already presented itself in, in Tower Records closing. And so I spent the better part of seven years learning how to make a documentary uh, and surrounding myself with people that helped me 
uh, that had those skill sets. And so found a way based on, you know, the opportunities that presented themselves or that I hustled for. And I was able to do it. And, you know, look, I would have loved to have made that for a significantly more amount of money. And I would have loved to have made it with, an, you know, an RA camera. But I was shooting, we shot sequences of that movie on a Canon 5D, like, camera. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> the kind that you could buy at, like, just a camera shop for a couple hundred bucks now. That's how we did it. Because it was just like, that's, that's. That's the opportunity that we have. Um, mm. So I could say I've not talked myself into a box because I don't know how we got on this subject. But um, <laughs> you know, you you just try to enjoy. I remember now. You you just have to enjoy the process of of what you do. And in that regard, I'm incredibly lucky because there are a lot of people that don't have that. You know, that they don't have that job that they're super passionate about. They don't have that opportunity. Uh, they were not given that opportunity. That's um, something that is not lost on me at all. Um, you know, especially, you know, given my circumstance, I, 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 I get it. So um, that's why for me, I always just want to focus on, you know, do I enjoy it? And am I, what am I learning from it? And and just kind of concentrating on that. Well, it seems like if we we're going to boil down your wisdom there, we'd come back to. Well, remember, watch pot never boils. So, it, you know, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know if we're going to um, get to the wisdom. Yeah. 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 Well, we're going to get to the wisdom <laughs> that focus on what you can control. No matter what it is you're doing, focus on the things you can control, not the yeah. things that you can't. Can. Yeah. And whatever it is you're doing, you're building up skills towards something. And you may not know what that something is, but whether that's acting, making movies or any other line of work, and you're not getting the opportunities you want, you are building skills towards something and you never know what those opportunities might be. And when it comes, if you spent that time building up those skills, you'll be ready to seize that opportunity when it comes. Yeah, I, yeah, that that's <laughs> wow. You actually, you made me sound really, really smart. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's true, and you know, and look again. You know, majority of the time, you learn more from your failures than you do your successes. You know, I mean, I did. I, I had the 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 harebrained notion of you know starting a handkerchief company. <laughs> yeah, um, I learned. I had to learn an entire new industry in my 40s yeah. um and it was a challenge and it was hard and ultimately um it didn't succeed to the level i wanted it to but it it was a success i did it yeah i have them, right you know i i you know uh, people i have one, i have a couple too <laughs> there you go um so even that's a good example of you know following your gut and you look sometimes it doesn't work out and it sucks and it's hard but you know you you do more often than not you build on all of your experiences and you know it'll guide you it, uh, you know it'll 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 get you somewhere you know yeah. and and if you know a lot of people that I talk to I mean I remember hearing this very early on Someone, you know, hit big and, you know, had this great job that I was, you know, I can't remember exactly what it was. It, what it was doesn't matter. But what they had said really struck me, which was that it wasn't planned. They were in the right place at the right time with the right attitude. And that is kind of how I've operated since trying to be in the right place at the right time. But most importantly, with the right attitude and um, go from there. I had some trepidation about starting a podcast in my 
forties where it was like, man, if this thing fails, like there you go. it's, it's not like a business venture where there's a little distance from it and you're selling something and maybe they don't want the service or the product that you're selling. I'm like, this is like my, I'm, I'm in this as a person and my face is on it, man, if that thing fails, like that's me failing. Uh, and I, to bring it back to football, I remember thinking about full circle, Guardiola. the shape of this, the shape of a ball. Full circle. We're, we're, we're bringing it all the way back we're around. Bringing it all the way back. Tying it up in a nice bow. Go ahead. What were you saying? Pep, they just had a big Champions League game and a guy had missed a PK that would have tied it up and taken Man City into, into extra time. Okay. But he missed and they lost the game. And that was it. They were out. And they asked him about the guy missing the PK in the... Oh, Pep. And for those who don't know English football, Pep is, yes. the, Pep is the first name of the head coach of Manchester City. Yes. And one of the greatest coaches of all time, formerly of Barcelona, my, uh, that's in my heart and in my veins. <laughs> and he said, the only people that miss penalties are those that have the balls to get up there and take one in the first place. Wow. Yeah. 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 Yeah, totally. So if we're talking handkerchiefs or just putting yourself out there for in whatever line of work you're in, uh, just like you said, you, you're learning something from it. You're building skills from it no matter what. And focusing on the success or failure, well, that part of it is usually out of your control. But if you Completely. man, you focus on all the stuff you can control, yeah. there is a form of success that you will achieve no matter what if you execute the things you can execute. And, and by the way, something that I really did just learned in the last, I would say, 10 years, a huge chunk of that is leaning into being incredibly uncomfortable mm -hmm. and having self-doubt and not being sure if it's the right thing, not being sure if it's going to work, um, or being intimidated, you know? Um, you got to lean into that. And I've found that, you know, that doesn't just apply for when I'm dressed up like a wizard and I need to say the thing like you feel super dumb doing it, but you can't <laughs> look, you can't look like you're feeling super dumb. You have to, you have to fake it. Um, but it also applies to, Hey, what about this for an idea? You know? Hey, let me give you a call. And hey, I got this idea. What do you think? I mean, even just that, you, you got to put yourself on the line. You have to lean into that, that feeling of, of, of the uncomfortable. And it's not easy. It's, it's not easy. And uh, there's still plenty of stuff that I'm uncomfortable about that I'm like, I can't lean into that yet, or I need to be better at leaning in on that. That's all part of it. So yeah, that quote is actually really interesting because it's, it's really that it, it's, it's, it's that perspective, right? Both things it, can it, be true. You know, yes. both things can yes. be true. Well, along those lines, I, I find somehow cold plunging comes up in every conversation <laughs> that I have. A lot of people talk about all these, oh, physical benefits from doing it. I really think at the end of the day, it just comes down to, it is super uncomfortable and there's, something really great about routinely doing something that is always going to be uncomfortable. You never really get fully used to it. You get better at it, but you're always uncomfortable doing it. And it does somehow make it easier. The more often you do uncomfortable things and put yourselves in those in a, in a position where it's physical discomfort yeah, totally. or emotional, mental discomfort you do get better at that part over time. You start to learn being uncomfortable isn't so bad. Com completely. Uh, to the point where, I mean, I'll, I'll even simplify it to a much more granular level. You know, when I started doing cold plunges and stuff and uh, sort of learned to love sort of the rush of it, it still hasn't gotten any easier. It's still brutal. But I remember my kids going like, why, why do you do that? And I go, I don't know, you know, it, I don't know. It's like an old man thing, you know, but it, it feels good on my body. And I learn, I learned to like it and they go, Oh, I can't do that. I'm like, you know, when you get older, all of a sudden you, you realize, you know, the stuff that you didn't like as a kid, all of a sudden you like, like, I don't know a kid in the world that is like, man, 
do I love mustard? But <laughs> as an adult, as you grow up, people learn to love mustard, you know, yeah. uh, to the point where it's like the only thing they want on their hot dog. That's me. Um, but you know, the uncom- you get used to that uncomfortable and then all of a sudden you don't feel it anymore. Or you don't taste it anymore. It's super, you know, like odd parallel, but, but I think it's, it's true. You just leaning into that uncomfortable, trying something new, you know, um, those kinds of things. That's, I, I believe that's part of, you know, being, being alive, being, being a human, you know, if, if you get to the point where you just go, I know everything that probably means you're, um, stop growing. Or you're officially too old to really care, you know, in, in which case I say, hey, you've earned the right to not to not do that. But, uh, you know, right now, at least that's not how I want to to think. You're going to keep putting mustard on it. Yeah, uh, whatever, mustard whatever that on thing it. is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. To, and yeah. take it with a grain of salt. We've got a lot of food metaphors going there. Well, I am a storyteller. I like I like putting a good button on a on on a thought all right Colin. i know you need to get out of here in a minute many times you've turned me on to new bands or old bands or just different kinds of music mm. you got anything that um yeah Good. of of interest right now that's just just piquing mm-hmm. your interest man i'm so glad that i have an answer to this question because last week i probably didn't but um there's this guy his name is jd mcpherson in he, he's a great musician uh, i discovered him when we were uh, we licensed uh, a song of his for tower records and i've been following him ever since and he just came out with a new record called night owls which is a really great um a really great record really cool sound and a really cool sort of progression from how he started to to where he's at now and to sort of see how his his music is has evolved and and his skills have, have evolved but that was literally I, I i put it on in the car the other day and was i just went like this like to myself like oh my gosh this is great this is so good and it had been a while since i had had that feeling so it was really really nice to be able to experience that again so yeah jd mcpherson's uh night owl record is uh pretty fabulous well i love it and to bring it all back around just one more time for fun mm-hmm. that's probably a guy that has lived all the stuff we've been talking about in terms of grinding away at it, building those skills. I know for a fact he has. I know for a fact he has. You know, I, 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 I know. Um, he was. I mean, he used to work at uh, the barber shop. Apparently, he used to work at one of my old uh, barber shops. I used to go to. I didn't see him when he was there, but uh, he kn- knew all these barbers that I know. I'm like, how are you guys not changing? They're like, he worked at the shop. Like, oh my god. So I know oh, he's, wow. he's worked hard, you know, creative. Yeah. And now he's got Colin Hanks talking about him on a podcast and he's just going to, he's going to go huge. Uh, Every little bit yeah. helps. That's right. That's right. Well, Hey, lovely to get to hang out with you yeah, man. today and enjoy the ride, man. Uh, exciting try. things are are coming. I can feel it. I really appreciate that, man. This has been really fun. It's been, yeah, I know it's been a long time since you and I have actually been able to sit down and really have a conversation. So this has been great. And uh, while I wish it was face-to-face in person, I'm, I'm glad we were able to at least get this. As I like to say, I want the most, but I'll take the least. So I'm glad we got this. <laughs> there, there we go. There we go. Well, yeah, we'll uh, we'll have to get a uh, another LAFC game on the books. Or if we, if we really get ambitious, uh, maybe we'll meet up for a Wrexham game. No, oh, hey, come on now. Let's start looking at our schedules. Okay. It's only the bane of my existence looking at a schedule, but let's do it. <laughs> okay. All right, okay. Man. Thanks so much for having me, dude. Okay, everybody. Until next time, ask questions. Don't accept the status quo and be curious. <laughs>